Thanks, Katie. Good to see everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, and uh, as you probably know, I just got back from Italy yesterday. So if I just fall asleep in the middle of this, uh, that's why. No, I'm, I'm doing well. Surprisingly, I had a good night's sleep and uh, it's been a, been a really good day getting back on the, the schedule here. So my body thinks it's 2 a.m. instead of 7 p.m. What I'd like to do tonight, we're going to go over, as, as Katie said, we're in the second large group session uh, just after in your workbook, after the page 30, the second uh, commitment card login. And we're going to be looking at uh, genuflection, warming up for the mass, and the entrance procession. We're going to try to finish in an hour. That's the goal. And uh, at the end, we've had some questions come in during the first month, that, the questions that were repeated. I'm going to try to address those. And then if you have any questions that come up tonight, to address those as well and have everybody out of here by eight o'clock if you're in central time or in an hour. As you can see in the top of the page in the second large group section, uh, upper right, there's a shaded section with two scripture references, Philippians 2, 5 to 11, and Revelation 7, 9 to 17. I'd encourage you to spend some time uh, with those with Lexio Divina. Tonight, I'm going to read Philippians and just spend a, just a little bit of time in prayer and then we'll go into the presentation because we have a, a lot to cover tonight uh, in a short amount of time. So let's pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So this is the one from Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit. Guide our conversation this evening, that we may come to know you better, to appreciate the beauty of the Mass that you've given us. Mother Mary, we ask for your intercession that you may lead us closer to your son jesus take away any distractions that we may have tonight and help us just to receive to hear your voice deep within us we ask all this through christ our lord amen In the name of the father the son and the holy spirit amen so one of the reasons why we chose the scripture uh, in this is that Jesus, who is the son of God, emptied himself. And that's what the mass is all about. It's this self-emptying love that's put on display for us every time we go to mass. And it's a pattern of love that God wants to instill in us that this life is not about us. But it's about, as Jesus says, if you want to save your life, give it away. Pour it out for others. And so that's why at every Mass we have the consecration and we, we see how Jesus uh, emptied himself for us. And he calls us to go and do the same thing. Uh, and Jesus, through his self-emptying, it says uh, he was glorified and exalted. And so whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. So spend some time with prayer in Lectio Divina with the scripture. And as we go through these topics tonight, uh, I, want, I want to encourage you to pay attention to your own hearts. What strikes you? Um, what makes your heart jump? Maybe what challenges you? 
and write those down. And, and that would be other sources of prayer for you as well as, as we move forward. I'll, I'll say many things tonight, but different things will touch each, each person differently. And that would be because the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us each individually. So first, uh, the topic of, of genuflecting. We, we've talked about this before in the sense of what is it or who is it that we're genuflecting toward? So whenever you enter, enter a Catholic church, what are we looking for? We're looking for the tabernacle. So this is, you know, after we're going to go through how to prepare for mass. But look for the tabernacle and look for the, the candle that is lit near the tab tabernacle. So that candle is a sign saying that the blessed sacrament is here. And because that's Jesus, who is God, we genuflect to the tabernacle. If the tabernacle is directly behind the altar, we would genuflect toward the tabernacle and it would include the altar. Uh, but like, for example, here at Notre Dame, the tabernacle is off to the right a little bit and the, and the, tab the uh, altar is straight. We would genuflect toward the tabernacle and we would bow toward the altar. And uh, the proper way to genuflect, and I know you learned this probably in second grade, is to go down on your right knee. So your right knee is the one that's hitting the ground. And where this came from uh, was during the time of the knights, where they would have a, they would have a sword, and the, the sword would go on their left hip. And so whenever they would go before the king, they would genuflect before the king. And if, if uh, they genuflected on the wrong leg, the sword would, would get in the way. So just imagine a sword on your left hip going down on your right knee. And what we're doing is, as we come before Jesus, the King of Kings in the tabernacle, we're coming before him saying, I'm here at your service. I'm here to worship you. Uh, I'm here um, not just as your, your faithful servant, but also as your friend. Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves, but I call you friends. And we're here to do your will. Whatever you want, want us to do, that's what we want to do. So, uh, so genuflecting is that first topic. The second thing is warming up for Mass. And I've got a list of 10 things here. I might add a couple as we go, but um, 10 things to get us ready for mass. So it's interesting. We're, you know, we're into week, week six here and be formed and we haven't started the mass yet, right? That's because there's so much preparation uh, that goes into this. And, and we're trying to help each one of us understand better all of the different things that are happening in the mass. So number one. How do we prepare for mass or warm up? And if we think about it, if I don't know if any of you played basketball, you know, if, if your basketball game was at seven o'clock, you wouldn't show up at 7.15 to be ready to play the game, right? Uh, you'd show up at least, at least a half hour early to warm up and to get ready for the game. Now, I'm not saying you have to come to mass a half hour early, uh, but to think about this is that we're, we're coming to worship God. We're here to um, yeah, worship the King of Kings. And if we show up at the last minute um, and without any preparation, we're probably not going to get a whole lot out of it. But if we come uh, prepared, if we come early, I guarantee you, you're going to get more out of this. And it's not just what we get out of it. It's what we bring to it. Uh, but your, your experience is going to be more full. So kind of think of that analogy uh, of, of a game um, in the sense of how am I preparing to worship the King of Kings? So the first thing is to pray with the scripture before coming to Mass. Um, I know, I know kids who will read books before they go watch the movie. You know, I'm, think of the Harry Potter series. You know, some of those books were five, six, seven hundred pages. And I know kids who not only would read the current book for the movie, 
but they'd go back and read the whole series again in order to prepare to watch the movie. And it really struck me as like, wow, you're going to read 700 pages before watching a movie. But do we invest five minutes in reading the scriptures before mass? Um, and so my encouragement is not just reading them real quickly, but, but to pray with them, to engage the readings, uh, maybe even to do Lectio Divina like we're, we're teaching here and jotting down notes. The reason why this is important is you're going to, you're going to be able to engage in the mass much more um, for a few reasons. We've all been seated at, at mass when we might have uh, a noisy baby around and I, I love kids and I want the kids to be there at mass, but sometimes it's hard for us to hear because of maybe some distractions. And if, we, if we've already read the readings and prepared, it's not a big deal because we know the readings. But if we haven't prepared and we miss some key words in that reading, we're, we're lost already. Um, another reason it's important is when the priest or deacon is preaching the homily, uh, you've already engaged the readings and you're going to be able to engage the homilists much more. Uh, you're going to say, oh, I, I thought about that. That same thing came to my prayer. Or I was thinking this, but he's preaching this, but I can see how they, they go together. Or I would have taken it a whole different way, but this is interesting as well. So it, it allows you to engage just like it would reading a book before you go see the movie. So number one, read the scripture and pray with the scriptures before arriving at mass. Number two. Uh, fasting an hour before Mass, if possible. Uh, I know people uh, say that, you know, gosh, I, I didn't know you're supposed to fast before receiving communion. Why does the church teach this? It's because when we receive communion, we are receiving God into our, our very being. in Because we believe that the host is the body of Christ, uh, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And what we want to do is to prepare our whole body to receive him. Um, if we've, you know, if we just had a, a, a happy meal before showing up at mass, um, it's, it's not making that proper preparation for the Lord. Uh, people will ask me, is it, is it meant to be an hour before mass starts, an hour before communion? Uh, I would always say, you know, it, it used to be, those of you who remember, you know, you had to fast from midnight, right, until you receive communion. And so if you went to a noon mass or even later, you were, you're pretty hungry by the time communion got there. And so I, I would encourage you an hour before mass starts. Um, and not just, not just to say, I'm going to white knuckle it and not, not, eat, not eat anything, but it, it's a time of preparation. If so I was just in, in Rome last week, and we got to be maybe six to eight feet away from the Pope. Um, if I told you you were going to meet the Pope today, you would go through a lot of preparations in order to meet him. I'm sure you would clean your house and prepare the best meal and put on your best clothes. Well, we're meeting more than the Pope at Mass. You know, we're meeting God himself. We're meeting Jesus. And so that's why the church asks us to fast before going to Mass. Um, number three, I, I would encourage you, and it kind of goes along with what we've been saying about the game, to try to arrive at least 15 minutes prior to Mass. Um, there's some churches, it, it's interesting in my experience, every church has its own, um, you know, kind of culture and there there's certain there's certain churches that gosh i'm walking up the aisle and the, the pews are half full and by the time the homily comes the church is full and they've missed some key parts and we're going to talk about those key parts of the mass uh, coming up but just an encouragement just like you'd show up to your your basketball game early or think about those people who have you know bears tickets They'll go down and they'll, for a noon game, they'll get there at 7 a.m. and start, you know, cooking and uh, having everything ready. They'll go five hours before a football game, but we show up last minute or sometimes late for mass. 
And so as you, as you approach the church building, um, this is still number three, recognize that it's a sacred building. We've been kind of leading up to this the, the last several weeks, that this is a place of prayer. And so as you, I want you to pay attention as you leave your car, you know, is there a plaza? What's on the facade of the church that kind of points you to that this is a, a place of prayer? Um, as you walk into the, uh, as you enter the first door, this is number four. As you enter the first set of doors, ask Jesus for the grace to leave behind the profane, to kind of set behind you, uh, you know, the world for, for a little bit and prepare to enter this sacred place of prayer. This doesn't mean we can't bring our, our petitions. Maybe we're really worried about someone. Bring that prayer into, into the church. God wants you to bring that intention. But, you know, all of the things that keep us preoccupied from praying, we're going to leave that behind and we're going to enter this place of prayer. That's number four. Number five, as you place your hand on the door, um, remember we talked about this, that Jesus says, I am the gate, you know, and as we enter that door, Jesus is, is that gateway to heaven on earth. And so we give, we give God thanks for this opportunity to worship him, to thank him, to bring our petitions to him, you know, to, there's so many things that we can be grateful for and, and people to pray for. And so to come with this attitude of what am I bringing to mass rather than a consumer mentality, like, okay, what are you guys going to give me? This music better be good. This homily better be good. And, and that's not to say the church shouldn't give us the best. Um, but you see that difference. Uh, what's the difference between what am I going to receive here versus what am I bringing to the altar? So number five, enter with gratitude as we enter this door. Number six, we talked about the baptismal font. Now, when, when COVID isn't happening, uh, you know, and there, there are some churches that have some holy water options. Um, have that baptismal font be a reminder of what? It's our own baptism. So we, we either find water. If there's no water, we make the sign of the cross as a reminder of our own baptism, uh, that we are entering into this relationship with the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're reminding, we're reminding ourselves that uh, just as Jesus died for us in our baptism, we die to our old self and we rise to new life. And so all of this is happening in just the, you know, before we even sit down in the church um we're all of these reminders but are we aware you know are we are we worried about everything else that's going on in our lives and we we forget you know what's happening in this sacred place that's number six number seven as we talked about uh, a little bit earlier so we're gonna look for the altar and we're gonna bow to the altar um, you know, so, for example, at the cathedral in Joliet, we have a, a separate room for the Blessed Sacrament, Blessed Sacrament Chapel. So you're going to come in, you're going to, uh, before you get into your pew, you're going to bow to the altar and genuflect to the tabernacle. Again, if they're lined up, you can genuflect right to the tabernacle. You don't need to bow and genuflect if, if they're all in the same direction. Um, so, number eight. Uh, before you enter your pew, that's when you're going to genuflect toward the the blessed sacraments, the blessed sacrament. So recognize your own smallness and the greatness of God. Uh, again, showing up as as a knight, as a soldier, as a, a beloved son or, or daughter of God, saying, "I'm here at your service." Um, I remember Father Hennessy saying one of the one of the great spiritual practices is to go outside at night on a bright, uh, you know, not a bright, but a, a starry night and look up and say, you are God and I am not. You are God and I am not. So when we're genuflecting, we're recognizing that I'm not God, that I am, I am God's son or daughter, 
and I'm here to serve him. I'm here to do his will. And so we ask Jesus for that, that humble heart. Um, yeah, I just see that question that came through. If you can't physically genuflect, then uh, we'd, we'd ask for what they call a profound bow, which is a bow from at your waist. And if you can't bow, even just a nod of the head. So what, what we're doing is, it's a very good question, Jane, because sometimes we can judge people to say, wow, that person didn't genuflect. Some people can't. There's even priests who can't genuflect because maybe they've had surgery on their knees. And so let us not, let us not judge one another. Um, God knows our hearts and what our external uh, body gestures are meant to do is to reflect a humble heart. And so anything like a bow of the head, a bow at the, at the waist or a genuflection is meant to say, you know, God, you're, you're great and amazing. And I'm your, um, I'm your humble child here before you. So very good question. Uh, number nine. Uh, so if you're able to, and if the church has uh, kneelers, so, so take advantage of our comfortable kneelers in most of our churches. <laughs> so when we were in Italy, you know, all the, all the churches had no cushions and all the seats and the kneelers. So you're, you're kneeling on wood. And um, so take advantage of the, the comfortableness that we have. So what we do is when we, when we enter, so normally we'd enter, we genuflect, make the sign of the cross, we'd kneel down. And what are we doing during that time of prayer? Um, again, if you can't kneel, you can, you can be seated. Um, it's time to bring your, your thanksgiving to God. You know, imagine if you had 15 minutes before mass to do this, take five minutes to thank God for all the blessings of the week. Maybe bring your own petitions to God. Who are the people that you want to pray for? Um, and you know, what are the struggles that you've been experiencing during the week? And then ask him for the grace to be present so that you can be totally aware at this mass. Lord, help me to hear your words, to appreciate you in the Eucharist, to recognize that, you know, all of these people here are part of my spiritual family. So give God thanks, ask for, you know, graces and blessings and ask for the ability to be present for the next hour or so. And then after your prayer, uh, if there's still time before Mass, number 10 is to pray with the scriptures uh, before Mass. You know, look at the readings again. Really anticipate the Mass like you would go into your favorite ball game or movie or theater um, to say, wow, Lord, the, the Lord wants to have an encounter with me at this Mass. Um, a couple other things. Those are, those are like the top, top 10 um, and not in any significant order, but I'm going to, I'm going to add just a, a few here. Um, one, I encourage you to dress up for mass. Um, we, you know, I didn't grow up going to church, but I remember like my grandparents, they were always dressed I don't know what this expression means. It's addressed to the nines, you know, I don't know where that comes from, but what they were saying by their, by their the way they dress was, this is important. This is something sacred. And this is not, you know, the same as the, it's not my work. Now I'm not saying you can't wear your work outfit because you might be going to work or there. I've seen children in, in their sports uniforms because they're going right to a game. That's, that's fine. We, we want you to be there rather than not. But if you have the opportunity and the time to, to really dress up because um, it says something, and we're going to talk about uh, the, the body gestures at Mass and what they, what they mean, what they're intended for. And the way we dress says something as well. Um, another thing I want to point out is confession. Um, 
we've been talking in Beformed uh, the importance of confession. I, I've been encouraging everyone to go uh, about once a month. Um, and especially if, if there's serious sin, go, go more often. Because communion is such a beautiful thing. It is, it's that, that great sign that's saying, I am in union with God and with my brothers and sisters. And they, the church teaches that the, the grace is objectively there. So we know that that is Jesus, whether we believe it or not, it is. We just saw two Eucharistic miracles while we were in Italy. Um, scientifically shows that it's the, you know, the, the host turned into the flesh of a human heart and the wine turned into human blood always the same type of blood. I encourage you to study these Eucharistic miracles. So objectively, it's Jesus. The way we receive grace is depending on our disposition. So if we're full of serious sin, uh, you know, St. Paul says we bring condemnation on ourselves if we don't reconcile before we receive communion. And so my encouragement is if you have serious sin, go to confession. Uh, before receiving communion. If, you're, if your sin isn't serious, um, I still encourage monthly confession, but that's why the, the penitential rite at the beginning of Mass is so important. That's why, you know, to show up early and on time is it's that opportunity to say, Lord, I'm sorry for any of my sins this week, and I want to be, be open to receive your graces today. So the importance of confession. Um, and also to be, as you get into the pew, to be conscious that this, this is not your pew or not your home, but this is the home of our church family. And I know it's hard because many of us, like on planes, I love to sit on the aisle. And sometimes we go into church and we're going to sit on that aisle and nobody's going to sit in my place. Um, but I would encourage you, if you get there early, maybe go to the middle of the pew where nobody has to climb over you and, you know, people can come in very easily. I know it's, it's, it's hard to change. Um, we have our, uh, I'm, I'm the kind of person I like change. So when I, if I go to, you know, classes, I like to sit in different places all the time and, and mess everybody up. But uh, if you're a creature of habit, this may be a challenge to maybe slide into the middle of the pew. Um, and one other thing I'd encourage is uh, at the back of, of our workbook, those of you who have the workbook, I think the back page has references. And there's some great books here that will, it's going to give you, that's where I, I've been drawing some of my material from. I'd encourage you to continue to study books like this because I'm not able to cover every little detail about the mass because that's that would be a few years long course. But books like this can help you uh, understand more of the biblical foundations of the mass. So, so those are some of the things I would encourage um, as you as you prepare for mass. The entrance procession. And here I'm drawing from uh, what's called, it's in the Roman Missal. It's called the General Instruction of the Roman Missal. It's at the beginning. So the big book that the priest uses at the altar, this is where we get all of our prayers from. Uh, it's called the, the Roman Missal. And there's a part in there that's called the General Instruction. In, in church lingo, we call it the germ. It's G-I-R-M general instruction of the Roman Missal. Uh, that's where I'm getting some of this material for tonight. So it says for the, the entrance procession that it, it begins with, so you, you've had time to get there, genuflect, kneel and pray, sit and look, look over the readings. And now mass is about to begin. So you, you know that the, the priests and the deacons and outside of COVID, there's generally more people, the servers uh, line up for the procession. And the, the general way to, for the procession would be 
uh, the person with the, the incense, if there is incense, and we're going to talk about that. Um, actually, it's for the video tomorrow. And then uh, the cross bearer, the person with the, the crucifix, and then the other servers with candles, and then any of the, the other lay ministers, and then the deacon, and then the priest. Of course, if the bishop is there, the bishop would be the last one in. And it starts with a song. And so what, what is the purpose of the entrance procession? We talked about processions earlier on in, the, um, in this season. And there's, you know, different processions, but the entrance procession is meant to one, open the celebration. So whenever you hear that opening uh, chant or hymn, uh, that's saying, okay, we're, we're, we're beginning. And this should be like our national anthem. You know, I, I'm not a big hockey fan, but, you know, when they sing the national anthem at a Blackhawks game, the whole crowd's going crazy and everybody's getting excited because they know the game's about to begin and we're celebrating our country. This, this opening hymn is meant to, to signal for us that we're about to have an encounter where heaven meets earth at this altar in front of me, where I'm going to be able to receive into my body the very body, blood, soul, and divinity of God, of Jesus Christ. And so it, it opens a celebration. It fosters unity for all of those present. So this is, a, again, a reminder that, you know, at Mass, we are all sons and daughters of the living God, which makes us all part of the same family. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Another purpose is it, it introduces our thoughts to the mystery of the liturgical time or festivity. So you might notice, you know, like this Sunday, oh, Father's wearing green. It's the 29th week in ordinary time. We're counting the weeks until we get to the season of Advent. Or if you go during the week and, oh, Father's wearing red today. It must be, must be a martyr today. Um, or something about the Holy Spirit. Or he's wearing white and, you know, uh, we're celebrating some saint today. So to pay attention as you see the procession going by, oh, what color is Father wearing and what, what kind of season uh, and what, what are we celebrating? And then the, the last purpose of the entrance procession is it's, and the music is to help accompany the priest and the ministers to the altar. And again, those processions are, are signals that we are on a journey. Remember that, that life journey from the baptismal font until the, the altar where, you know, one day our, our funeral celebration will be. And everything in between represents this journey of life that we're on. In, uh, and I'm not going to get too deep into music here, uh, but there's in diocese in the United States, there's four different options for the entrance chant or, or hymn. Um, if you go to uh, a daily mass, like here at Notre Dame, what we do is we recite the entrance anaphon. So if there's no music, uh, we can recite that anaphon. If you have that Magnificat, for example, it'll say um, above the, the collect or the opening prayer, it'll say entrance anaphon. And we recite that as we process in, if there's no music. Um, or we can sing that. Sometimes they, they'll sing that entrance anaphon, anaphon for the entrance procession, or they can sing another hymn that is approved by the, the USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, and it also is approved by the, the local diocesan bishop. Know that the, the diocesan bishop, so here in the Diocese of Joliet, Bishop Ronald Hicks is the chief liturgical officer. In other words, uh, he has a lot of ability to decide this is, um, this is what's going to be permissible in the Diocese of Joliet. There's certain laws that are universal, that every church in the world will do the same thing. And then there's certain things, um, certain ways that you might celebrate uh, within the diocese that the bishop has um, authority over. He can't override, you know, in the sense of he's going to change the mass that comes to us, you know, from Rome. But it might be something specific that he might say that we're going to celebrate this way. 
uh, he, he could say, at all of the churches in our diocese today, uh, I want this to be the entrance hymn because I want this to be kind of the, the thrust of the celebration this weekend. Um, yeah, I, I won't go too deep into the woods there on, on, the, on the entrance hymn. Uh, and if there's no singing, I mentioned we can, we can recite the entrance anaphon and that, that can be done in different ways. Uh, everybody in the church can recite it together. Um, some of them can, or you can have the lector do it or the priest or deacon can do it as well. Uh, but that's meant to, and the entrance anaphon kind of points us to what we're celebrating, uh, whether it's about a, a saint, or the readings of that day. And then once the entrance procession arrives at the altar, um, what we do is, it's just like what you do when you go into your pew. If the tabernacle is straight behind the altar, uh, we would have everybody genuflect, uh, go down to one knee. That's if, again, if everybody can do that. You might see there's, as I mentioned, some priests that can't genuflect and they would say, everybody, we're just going to do a profound bow showing that, you know, that altar, which we talked about last week and the, you know, Jesus and the tabernacle, these are, are sacred objects um, actually represent. And, and of course the, the tabernacle houses Christ there. So after that bow or genuflection, we'll go up and the priest and the deacon uh will kiss the altar as a sign of reverence for what's going to happen on that altar and then the priest uh, can incense the cross and the altar you might see that at a usually at a higher celebration uh, we're going to talk about incense will be in tomorrow's video how that's meant to show reverence uh, for the altar and the and the crucifix and then after the, if there is incense, then the priest and deacon will go to their chairs and then make the sign of the cross and start the mass. And we're going to, in the coming weeks, we're going to go over uh, the parts of the mass. Um, and then the last section I want to talk about here, because it goes along with what we're talking about with genuflection, are gestures and body postures. Um, why do we do the things that we do? I, I remember before I became Catholic, you know, I was at Providence Catholic High School and I'd watch, I didn't know when to sit, when to kneel, when to, you know, stand. And I thought this is just like Catholic uh, at, uh, calisthenics, we call it. But there's a purpose behind what we do. And, and here's some of the purpose. So uh, a little bit of background to this. So our gestures are meant to lead us into what we're doing in the celebration. And they're meant to show the beauty and noble simplicity of the mass, both from the ministers. So that's why we're taught as, as priests and deacons and, and altar servers that everything we should do, everything we do should be done with reverence because what we're doing is we're worshiping God. And it's, so it's meant to show beauty and noble simplicity. Um, and so what we do is meant to, like the theology of the body, our body speaks a language. So for example, when we're kneeling, that says something. When we're standing, it says something. When we're seated, it says something. And so these are not just kind of random things that the church asks us to do, but they're meant to um, point to a different reality that's going on in our hearts and what we're, what we're doing. And what they're doing too is it's fostering participation of everybody there. And so the church really asked that what we do be, be uniform. And so that's why we don't want to have half the people standing, a quarter of the people seated, and then a quarter of the people kneeling. That shows disunity. And so I remember hearing this in the seminary. And at first I thought, well, oh, gosh, I, I like to pray this way. Uh, but your, your personal private prayer is different than this public prayer of the mass. And so what the church asks us to do is to, to, to be in this together, to show this unity uh, of the celebration. 
So that's the common posture is a sign of unity of, of the Christian community. Um, so what are our postures? So once the entrance procession, once the entrance hymn begins, what do we do? Everybody stands and it's just, we know what to do, right? Everybody instinctively starts to stand when the music starts. And we do that until after the opening prayer is finished. That opening prayer is called the collect. And we'll go, we'll go into that in the future. Collect means to collect all of the prayers. And so if we've gotten the mass early and we've kind of lifted up our prayers, replacing them on the altar figuratively, um, all of those prayers are collected together into that opening prayer. So listen to the prayers of the opening prayer and say, wow, my, my prayers are included in that as the priest lifts them all up to God. And then what do we do? We sit for the, uh, the Old Testament reading, the first reading, because during the Easter season, the first reading is from the New Testament. But generally, Old Testament, the Psalm, uh, the second reading, we stay seated. Uh, not that the word of God isn't important, but in relation to the gospel, which is you know where we hear Jesus speaking uh, in the first person, that's why once the Alleluia begins, we have everybody stand. Standing is, is a sign of honor. Again, this is something really important. Um, and so we stand for the Alleluia until the end of the gospel. Um, and then after uh, the gospel book is kissed by the deacon or the priest or the bishop, if he's there, then everybody is seated. And this is a time when uh, the homily uh, is shared. And so being seated uh, is, is a sign of being like a student and listening. During the time of Jesus, you know, the, the teacher sat and then the students would sit around the rabbi's feet. Um, here, the, the priest or deacon is standing and everybody else is seated to listen. And then after the homily, everybody stands again for the creed. Again, we, we proclaim our faith in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in the creed. And we stay standing for the universal prayer where we gather all of our prayers together into one. Or we're saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Then we're seated after the universal prayer. Until, so then the, the uh, preparation of the gifts is happening. And then when the priest says, pray my brothers and sisters then we stand um we'll stand from that point all the way uh, uh until communion with with times of kneeling and i'll, I'll get to that uh let's see yeah so what we do and this is different so this is a difference in the united states and some other countries so in some countries, they don't kneel until the consecration. Uh, in the United States, the bishop, bishops have asked us to kneel um, uh, right after the holy, holy, holy. That's how pretty much all of our churches do. So we kneel from the time of the holy, holy, holy until the great amen. You know, when the priest does what's called the doxology, and he says, through him, with him, and in him, and everybody says, amen then we stand and then we stand and recite the our father um and then when we when we sing or recite the lamb of god who takes away the sins of the world then we're kneeling again and that kneeling posture again is this this prayerful posture this posture of humility that i i am you know the creation and i'm here to serve the creator of the universe and then we prepare for communion so we get up, receive communion, and are encouraged to go back and, and kneel and, and pray after communion to give thanks. Um, it, it's, I find it interesting, and it happens everywhere I go, um, and I think maybe that's how it was taught, and it, it's not a bad thing. I just find it funny that, you know, normally everybody waits until the, the priest is seated and then they sit down, um, and that's, that's fine. Uh, you can remain kneeling if you want during that time, you know, once the priest sits down before he says, let us pray again. 
so either either one is fine there, but um, it makes sense to me too, as I'm saying that, that as the priest is seated, people can be seated and there should be some silence in there. We'll talk more about silence um, in the future to really allow, there's two key times of silence in the homily, in, in the mass after the homily to let the word of God sink in. And then after we receive communion to let the reality uh, of, of communion to sink in for us as well. Uh, the church says, uh, for the sake of unity, we should all follow the, the same directives that come from the priest or the deacon uh, at Mass. So I think that covers the area I wanted to cover tonight. So genuflecting, warming up for Mass, entrance procession. Then I added in there the, the gestures. Um, in the last 10 minutes, I want to cover some of the questions that people have been asking. And then if you have other questions, Katie and Rick can, can, uh, uh help me with those as well. Uh, cause I'm, I'm on my phone here and I might not be able to see the questions, but some of the questions that we've had, and if we hear them from several people, we know that maybe a lot of you have the same questions. So some came around the, the vesting prayers. Remember, I, I was doing the, the vestments and the prayers that the priest prays. Um, people ask, do, do deacons have the same prayers? Um, and they do. So when they put on the alb, the cincture, the belt, um, their stole, there are prayers for that as well. Um, do altar servers have these prayers? They can. Um, I don't know how many parishes have the altar servers, you know, pray the prayer of putting an alb or a, um, their, their vestments on, but it certainly wouldn't be a bad thing. Um, so yes, deacons do have those prayers as well. Is there a specific traditional reason why the deacons chasuble has sleeves? Um, I haven't found a, an exact answer on that other than that's, that's just how it developed. I don't think there's a, a particular um, reason for that, um, other than to differentiate, you know, like the, the priest sleeves are open. It looks like a, if you lay it out, it looks like a poncho, the chasuble, but the deacons have sleeves. And so that's, that's just meant to differentiate the two. And as I said, the, the deacon's stole goes across their chest, the priests uh, go straight down. Another question is the amice. So this is the thing that, that kind of covers the, the collar here. If the priest doesn't uh, wear one, does he still say that prayer? And the answer is no. Um, but if he does wear it, then he would say the prayer, of course. And um, what's the history and tradition of the Roman collar? So this is the Roman collar. Um, so whenever I do this with kids, they love to see what this is. It's, it's really just a piece of plastic. Um, I've actually read different reasons how, how this developed. Um, the color black, uh, is, is a sign of, of death. Uh, that's why we wear black a lot at, at funerals. Um, and so we wear black as a sign of, of dying to ourselves. Um, but this white is a reminder, just a little touch of white, uh, I read was, a sign of that, that call to live chastity and purity. Um, yeah, but if you, if you Google why do priests wear this Roman collar, you, you probably will hear a bunch of different stories of why it happened. So I don't know the, the exact reason. Um, do masses, daily masses always have one reading and the gospel or are there times when daily mass has two readings on the gospel? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, and I, I would also help us remember that it actually is the, the Psalm is another reading. We just, we normally sing it on Sundays. We recite it uh, during daily masses, but to remember that the Psalm is from the scriptures as well. So we really have on Sundays, we have four readings from scripture, old Testament Psalm, which is part of the old Testament. New Testament and gospel. 
Um, but daily mass usually has a reading, a psalm, and a gospel. Unless it's a feast day or a holy day, uh, you might have an Old Testament, a, a psalm, a, a New Testament, and a gospel. So there are days when a daily mass looks very much like a Sunday mass, especially on uh, solemnities. That's like the, the highest level. Like, you know, if Christmas falls on a, a Tuesday, it's going to be celebrated, uh, you know, like a Sunday and like the, the highest Sunday of the year.